हेलो नमस्ते सत श्रीकाल असल वेलकम बाय दिस इज योर ओन चैनल अल अशी शेफ एंड टुडे वी आर हियर एट इंपीरियल सिटी ब्रू हाउस लोकेटेड इन सारनिया व्हिच इज वन ऑफ द फाइनेस्ट ब्रूरी इन द रीजन दे आर नोन फॉर देयर यूनिक फ्लेवर्स यूनिक बियर एंड दे नॉट ओनली मेक द बियर हियर बट दे आल्सो गिव इट टू ऑल द बियर बार ब्रूरी इन ऑल ओवर द सारनिया एज़ वेल एंड आल्सो इन ऑन्टेरियो एज़ वेल so today we have the privilege of uh, having someone uh, who can show us the deep process of everything what's going on here inside and also we have the privilege to talk with owner as well so without any delay let's start today's video and don't forget to subscribe the channel so as i said that we have the privilege to talk with the owner of this place So, sir, can you tell your name to our audience? Uh, my name is Craig Brody. I'm one of uh, three owners of Imperial City Brewers. Kyle Blanford and Mike Marker are the other two. So, sir, what's the idea behind starting this uh, brewery, and when did you start it? So, we started. Uh, it started kind of as a backyard passion project. Uh, we just brewed in the backyard, made beer. I used to have a keg party every summer, and we would always make beer for that. And started hearing similar comments from people like hey this beer is really good you should do something with this uh, at the time we were discussing opening we just had refined in town uh, and then they were just working on their second location so uh, we figured the time was good we didn't know uh, what was coming with covid uh, so we started the plan put it into action and it took about from the time we said like let's open a brewery to the time we actually opened our doors i think it was about two years Maybe almost two and a half years. Uh, by the time we got everything built and found this place, and we were going to start off much smaller. Uh, we went. We spoke with a lot of breweries around Ontario. We met with uh, the guys from Andersons. We met with Storm Stage, uh, Fourth River. They were all great. We sat down and chatted with them, and we had a lot of the same questions for all of them, and kept hearing the same answers. And a lot of that was, you know, uh, they couldn't keep up. The demand was a lot more than they had expected. So we kind of went back to our business plan, looked at it again, and said maybe we should go a little bit bigger with this, and we did. And uh, we ended up going into a 10,000 square foot space with a 20 barrel uh, brew house. And when initially, I think we were looking at like a five to 10 barrel system. Uh, and it's a good thing we did that. Uh, COVID then happened. We opened up. We were only open for 14 shifts, and then COVID happened, and uh, we got shut down. But because we had a larger capacity, we were able to at least sell cans and make enough to do that. If we would have went smaller, I not possible. We would have made it through because we just would have been able to keep up, right? So, yep. Yeah. And uh, so you maintain that supply chain and demand. Yeah. And I mean, at that, again, in the, in the three years since then, or four years now, I guess, um, it's... You've obviously seen a lot of growth in Sarnia, uh, with more even coming. You know, we have friends, uh, Point Brew Company Company is uh, starting up very soon, and uh, but the demand is still there, and I think people still want craft beer. They want to try different things. Um, I think each place has its own unique thing to offer. Uh, if, if you can find that niche and you can find uh, what it is you have to offer that's different than other people, then um, I think it'll be successful. For us, we wanted to really push um, easy going you know we didn't start with a lot of uh, different beers we started with some very uh, rudimentary easy drinking beers and that went a long way for us it got a lot of people talking that not all craft beer has to taste different other beer uh, and then but since then we've been able to have more fun and try some different stuff like our, our sour collaboration and that guys is something outside of our comfort range but we, we really enjoy doing it and we so what is your uh, USP like what do you think differ you from or maybe stand make you stand out from other breweries I think maybe it can be in terms of capacity or flavors or yeah like as an event space as a place in Sarnia you know, we, we do have a 220 person capacity here we really push events to try and make that um, make us known for, for larger events and we love doing them we love having everybody here nothing better than seeing a packed house here and everybody having fun. Um, so we do have that as far as the space itself and the beer. Uh, we really push quality you to see on the side of our van. You know, it's premium craft products. Um, we try and source 
high quality ingredients because it goes a long way. Uh, and it's something that we pass on to the customers uh, that they just notice. If you're trying premium quality ingredients, you're going to notice the difference in the taste of food for sure. So that's something we've always started uh, from the start to now. We've always had that. And uh, we really try and promote using premium quality ingredients. What are your future plans? Uh, so the future plans um, kept getting wrenches thrown in with COVID. Uh, so initially, we, we would have already had a kitchen by now, uh, but then when COVID happened, it just didn't make sense to do that. We had to do a patio, so we, uh, we built a patio. And then now we're still in the process. Uh, we've got a few, few things in the works. Um, we will have a kitchen at some point that is coming. It just obviously takes time. Uh, we do need to look at expansion. First and foremost, we got to really look at getting the canning. We're getting very busy with canning. As you can tell, we're outside because we're canning right now. Um, but that's that's definitely on the agenda as well. Uh, the kitchen, I think, will be a game changer for you. So that's something that we really That will complete the facility. Yeah, and it would have already been done. I think uh, the initial plan for us was to have it done within the first year of being open, but then COVID just kind of threw the wrenches. Thank you so much for talking with us, sir. Thank you so much and for coming. Now we will go inside and check what's going on. Cheers. One is where I am standing right now. Behind me there are lots and lots of grains which they use for making beer. Each grain bag is of 23 kgs and when I asked them approximately how much it will be, then they said we don't have any idea, it's humongous, it's huge and they use it like within a week this much grain will be used to make the beer. So this is huge, I never saw this quantity of grain to make such huge quantity of beer. This is first time for me as well and you know I don't have words. And let's go to watch and see the second insane thing which all the beer lovers might get mad about it, might you know see the heaven out of that. So let's go. We are here inside the such a big storage of beer in Sarnia. I can I don't have words guys. Just look at this. What is there behind me? And let me know in the comment section that agar main aap logo ko ek raat ke liye is ke andar band kar dun to aap log kitni beer peena pasand karoge? Ya kitna beer piyoge? One of my dear friend Subendu if he is watching this video look at this place brother. Look at this place. I'm going crazy, crazy. Like I never saw this kind of huge quantity of beer in my entire life. We went to other breweries as well, but uh, this is crazy. I want to stand here for so long, but the temperature is too low. I'm feeling cold, so let's go outside. Now we are here inside, and we will understand the process of how they function while making the beer. Uh, in the Imperial City and Chef Tyler will guide us from here until the end process and then we will see the canning and then we will do the sampling. Fine Chef? Yeah, sounds great. So, chef. so back here is pretty much where it all starts. Um, if you like to see here, we have all of our grains kind of just laid out here on display. Um, so each beer we brew typically gets around, let's say about 18 to 25 different of these bags per recipe. Um, 
So um, all of our beer starts with the base recipe, um, a base malt, so we use their Pilsner malt or a two-row malt. And from there we get into um, the different styles, the different flavorings, the different grains and so forth. Um, so from here we take all of our grains, we'll break them down into our recipes. And then from that we'll bring them up into here. This is our, uh, where our hopper is. So all of our grains will go through here, get milled. And then from here they'll go up all into this, all the way up into the top here. Whoa. And then this will be our mash here. So yeah. the, yep. So everything, all of our grains will get processed through here and we'll crack the hulls on them and set them up into here. Um, so that thing will take about 20 something, 30 bags before it seizes up. We've had this seize up one time on us, it was closer to 30 bags, I want to say it was. But um, you can see how much volume that is for the grains to go into. How much. How much. You will fit that whole. And yeah. How much beer you can make out of that? Um, so it all depends on the different beers. So all the beer we do make is based off of 25 hectoliters, so 2,500 liters. 2,500 liters. Liters of beer for every brew we do. It's that. Wow. So every gray, every beer we do is that volume. Sometimes we use more or less grains depending on the alcohol percentage. So something that has an higher, higher alcohol percentage will use more grains to extract more sugars to get a higher uh, fermentation volume and alcohol percentage. Um, some beers like our light lager will have less grains in it, but we'll use the same amount of volume and water to brew. So it'll end up more like a 4% beer versus a 6% beer. So everything is the same amount of water, just a different amount of grains to achieve that alcohol percentage. So once everything goes into here, um, we'll drop it down to this tank here. This is our mash tank. So you can kind of see this as similar to almost making tea in a sense. Tea. Tea, yeah. Steeping, the process of yeah. steeping. Steeping a tea. So um, all the grains will go in there at a flow rate. So all those grains will be cracked. They'll be hitting hot water to help extract some of those enzymes and sugars naturally. And then um, you can almost look at it like making a tea. So the longer they sit in there, it runs a chance of them getting bitter, more tannins. So this process is really about getting your right temperature for hot water, um, a right milling speed for how long you mix this for, and uh, the right holding speed or temperatures and uh, time. So you want to hold these for the maximum amount of time to extract, extract the sugars without overdoing that time to make them bitter. So if you get them hot, too hot, you're not going to extract enough sugar from them. If you can do it too long, it's gonna, it doesn't work, it's going to be a nice process. So everything here is about uh, utilizing the time, Temperatures. Be patient. Yeah, exactly. Good things come to those who wait. So take your time in this process, and then that's where you're going to get a lot of your flavors and a lot of your sugars come from naturally. And from there, after this process is done, we'll send it over to here, which is our boil kettle. So the purpose of this is basically to pasteurize everything. At this point, all the sugars have been extracted from it, and we send it there to boil it to pasteurize it, and maybe reduce it just a little bit to make it more of a concentration. Um, so we'll send it up to here, so maybe if we fill it down to like 24 or so, we'll maybe reduce it down to 23. So, so when you take uh, like the sugar and you reduce it in water, and you get a thicker, more viscous kind of yeah. syrup out of it. Kind yeah, of the same the process. Yeah, so kind of the same process where we don't want like um, a thin, thin base for it. We kind of want it to be more of a, more of a syrupy kind of text, like uh, blossoms, so that way we get uh, ferment it nicely. Okay. So, up here is where um, we put our hops in. So in the boiling process, we also add uh, hops and other flavoring agents in this part. Someone can fall inside this. Yeah, yeah we'll uh, pop some lights in here. There is light inside it? Wow. Yeah. So um, this is the boil kettle. Nice. And then um, once everything is boiled in here, we add hops at various times for different beers. Um, after that process, it'll get transferred to the fermentation valves or vessels. So it'll follow through here. Oh, those so have pipes. I want the normal. Yeah, no, these are all hollow pipes. So the the warp will transfer from the bottom of this up into here, through here, and um, yeah. So this is a it's a heat exchanger. Oh. So on one side they run glycol and water, which this is our glycol setup here. And then on the other side we run the wort, the beer. Okay. So it goes through little thin channels. So when it comes through here, yeah. it's um, at a boil. So it's probably 80 plus, ABC plus. 
Plus, and then when it goes through here, you'll see on this part, there's a, a dial. And then we're able, yeah, right here, we're able to tell our fermentation temperatures. So sometimes we'll ferment something as low as 12 degrees Celsius up to something as high as 21 degrees Celsius. Okay. So when it goes through here at 80 degrees Celsius and it hits here, by the time it goes through this, it's dropping at you know, 60 degrees Celsius just through running through that plane there. Yeah. So now after that, it'll run through um, the hoses and set up now, but a transfer line. It, it is showing here 80. Is it the temperature? Yeah, that's the temperature. This is just our hot water here. Okay. So if we were to put the line from here to there, it's already at 80 degrees Celsius. Okay. Yeah. Um, so from the heat exchanger, it transfers over into our fermentation vessels. We have six of them. We ferment up to five beers at a time because we always keep one empty because we have to transfer the beer. So every time a beer is brewed, it gets two tanks. One to ferment in, one to finish in. So, um, we currently have nothing fermenting right now. Everything has been uh, either cold frost or empty because we just can today. So, um, in the fermentation process, we'll control this temperature gauge here. So we're able to make it warmer or colder. So as it ferments, um, we're fermenting those natural sugars that we had created out of it to create alcohol. So once all those sugars have fermented out completely, uh, we do what's called cold crashing it. Cold crashing. Yeah. So um, if we ferment something, say at 18 degrees Celsius, once it's been done fermenting, we go from 18 degrees Celsius down to minus two degrees Celsius. So that way, all the yeast that's up in there that's been fermenting almost like bread, right? So when it's warm, you watch it expand and create, and then when it's cold, it's it gets yeah. tenser, right? So when that happens, all that yeast is going to come down into this cone. So in its fermentation process, it's all mixed up in the, in the wort, creating beer. And then as it cools, once you crash it, all that yeast will drop down in suspension. And it'll come down into here. So after that part happens, we're able to reharvest that yeast and re it into another beer. Okay. So almost like a sourdough starter. When you uh, feed your starter, feed you let it volumize, you use that into something, but you have your discard left over that you're still creating the feed, right? Yeah. So we're the same situation here where we, uh, after a certain amount of beers, the yeast um, sells lower, so we're not able to use it as much. But there's a, as we use it a few times, they grow. Wow. So we're able to keep using that yeast, so we pitch that yeast. Um, but after I never knew this this thing that you can use the same yeast again and again yeah. by feeding it. You yeah. also feed? Um, the fermentation process is basically feeding it. Because okay. once we add all that wort and all those sugars to it, it kicks it up. It and naturally it, takes up. And it naturally will eat all those sugars. Wow. And then uh, when we cold crush it, we're able to use it again. So it's almost like putting a sourdough starter in the fridge for the next time you're going to use it. So we do uh, a few different kinds of yeast based on the different styles of beer. Uh, but most yeast we get a few generations out of it, so we're able to repitch the yeast, you know, anywhere from like five to ten times, depending on the yeast, depending on the style of beer, depending on how much cell count is left in that yeast. So like in you know, a sourdough, there is a mother starter. Yep. Do you also have those kind of things? Uh, well, we pitch the whole batch, so we don't save any to grow and continue. Um, we'll pitch the whole batch. You you push it uh, to an extent. Yeah. And then you drop it. And then once we see the yeast starts becoming stressed out a little bit. We don't stress it out anymore because then that affects the quality of beer. And it can be more hazy, more strong. Yeah, you get different flavor components out of it. You get different off gases, more like sulfur kind of components in there. Different flavors that aren't very nice to have in your beer. So before it hits that time, we get rid of the beer or get rid of the yeast and we uh, switch up more yeast. So uh, every beer has its own different style of yeast depending on what style of beer it is. So we're able to. Uh, continue those cultures going, so anywhere we'll have anywhere from three to five different kinds of yeast on hand at all times, depending on what kind of style of beer we're brewing. One question, Chef. You are a chef by profession. Then how you got interest in these things? Um, well, I've always had an interest in feeding people something in that terms, creating something, feeding it, getting general feedback as to how people like the creation or whatever the case may be. So going into COVID, um, pre-COVID, friends of mine opened this brewery and they were looking for someone that was going to help assist them in um, production and the food aspect of things. So I agreed to help them out with that and then because of COVID, 
there was no rush on the kitchen because we weren't very sure how much money to invest in this and something that might be closed in a week, a month, or yeah. down the road. So I saw a lot of connections between uh, making food and making beer in terms of um, having yeah, yeah it has, it's like following a recipe, right? Yeah, so once, the more familiar you are with the recipe, the better you are at the recipe, the more you want to involve yourself to get better at doing more things like that. So I thought it was a good place for me to start, to um, learn, something new. learn something new while COVID was going on. The restaurant industries were really suffering at the time. A lot of it was a lot of takeout, things that I wasn't really necessarily interested in. Yeah, same thing, same boating stuff. Yeah, so I figured if I were able to learn a whole new trade, but still be in my comfort zone with creating a product, following a recipe, looking for efficiencies, trying to make it better than it was the last time. I see a lot of those things transferable from creating food to making beer. Um, there's a lot more science involved in this. You can't really taste it as you go and say, you know, this needs salt, this needs sugar. It's more like a baking process where you kind of cross your fingers, trust the system, know that you did, um, you followed the techniques properly, you got your efficiencies done properly, and then if you're comfortable with doing that, there should be no reason why your beer didn't turn out well. So it's kind of uh, similar to cooking, but more like baking. In yeah. the sense that once you open the oven, you kind of say, how did my cake turn out? Same with this, once you package your beer, how did my beer turn out? Yeah. Um, obviously there's ways you can indicate as you track the system. All the labor of love. All the labor of love, exactly. Thank you, chef. This is the way they can their beer. They simply line them up in that panel and it goes one by one for the filling of the beer like this as you can see in the video the red color nozzle on the left side helps to fill the carbon dioxide and take out the oxygen whereas the right hand side there is a pipe which helps to fill the beer of the desired flavor and it passed through and you can see it is canned now and it is passing through the water shower so that the cans can get clean and then they get wiped by the person and they stack them up accordingly we are here to do the sampling uh, obviously this is looking very beautiful and very appetizing thank you chef for this one so what are we trying today chef uh, so we're going to do a little bit of uh, the whole beer spectrum today so first we're going to start you off with the goodbye gravity uh, goodbye gravity is our staple beer here it's a cream ale and it has a little bit of vanilla in it so uh, the vanilla gives it a little bit more palatability to go with the creaminess of the cream ale so from the corn and the uh, the rice that comes from this gives it a nice creamy mouthfeel, and the vanilla will take it that next step higher just to give it more um, more flavor components. Like uh, usually when I buy this outside, it looks like a little cataract feeling, you know, like hazy. Yeah. But wow. Here it is looking very clear. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times too, depending on with it being the craft beer, depending on our tanks are very large. So depending on where the beer is coming from in the process, uh, the filtration system might be a little clearer, a little less clear, depending on how much beer is in the tank and where exactly it is. So when we can and keg the beer, they come from different parts of the tank. So usually we would can a lot of the beer first, and then this is kind of what's left the last little bit. And uh, we just serve that in uh, I can feel it in the vanilla, right? Yeah, you'll taste the vanilla. and It'll be a little bit creamy of a mouthfeel from uh, the corn. We'll give it that extra bit of a uh, sweet and taste to it. Cheers. Yeah, there is an aftertaste of vanilla and a heavy creamy kind of aftertaste at yeah. the back. So a lot of that comes from the, the grains and the addition of corn and rice into the, the brew itself. And then uh, the vanilla helps complement some of that grain flavor that you're getting, almost like a cereal. It, it's a strong one. Yeah. So a little bit of bitterness from the vanilla as well, because some of that vanilla has, uh, the Madagascar vanilla has a little bit of a bite at the end, yeah. so that helps with the, the hops at the end as well. And then what's the next one, chef? Uh, here we have the cerveza, so it's going to be a Mexican lager. It's kind of a traditional, uh, almost like a Corona in a sense. So it's going to be a nice clean pout little beer, but it's also good for those hot, hot days where um, there's quite So what's the Mexican element into that? Um, so there's a lot of rice and corn in this one too. So a lot of these two, um, the gravity and the cerveza, in the brewing process, um, rice and corn goes into the mash to help produce some of that uh, the sweetness and um, some of those palatable molecules. So this one we serve sometimes with lime or a little bit of salt. 
have a little kind of uh, uh, milder than this one. Right. It is milder than this one. Yeah. Much milder. Yeah, a little bit more mild than that one, less hops than this one. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, designed to be just kind of that summer beer where you're out on the beach, you don't want to get anything heavy or bloated in you, you just want a nice, nice fizzy white or a nice fizzy yellow beer. That's the one to go for. This one, Chip? Uh, so this one is our hazy IPA. Um, it gets more into the hoppy profiles. You can tell by its nice hazy appearance there, um, due to the yeast and the hops that we put into it. Um, so this one registered a little bit higher in terms of alcohol percentages. You ferment it more than other beer. Um, ferments yeah, faster. Can, uh, oh, faster. Yeah, so the lager will take longer to ferment at a colder rate. This will ferment at a higher temperature for a faster period of time. Um, also, with the addition of oats and the grain, so this would have lots of um, rice and What's corn. What's the main element in this one? In terms of like its haziness, will be from like the oats. So it's got oh. some, yeah, some toasted oats, some rolled oats in there. And then you're going to notice a lot more hoppy than the other ones. Yeah, it's got more the of the flavor is there. Yeah, and it tastes more uh, citrusy. Yeah. It has more of those uh, kind of lemony. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of that comes from the hops. Um, this one gets hopped twice. In the end, yeah, it's a little bit different than the other ones. Um, it is uh, dry on the dry side. Yeah, so Peter. yeah, so it gets dry hop. So uh, for these beers here, we ferment them. This one we flavor with a good by gravity. This one, when it's in the fermenter, we put more hops in it as it ferments, and then when it's done fermenting, we put more hops in it again for the egg. Yes, I think at the very end. And then yeah. you keep it for how many days? Um, usually, it will sit for about a week. That will impart some extra. Some of it, yeah, so every time we add any of the hops to it, we usually like to wait about four days for the extra hop cycle. So that way it extracts all those um, hop flavors and acids out of the hops, and then we go ahead with the next one. This one, too. Uh, so this here is uh, the peanut butter porter. So this one started off as a seasonal beer that we were just going to offer one time, and that was it. But people liked it a lot, and then they said, we want that to stay. So um, this one is a traditional porter style brew, but we uh, added flavors like we did with the Goodbye Gravity of uh, chocolate milk and peanut butter. So uh, when we talk about chocolate milk and peanut butter, what we put the, like we literally put the peanut butter? Uh, not in this one, some beers we do have that component where we add um, like our Belgian wit, we'd add fresh orange uh, rind and zest to it. Um, rather than adding peanut butter and making it messy or uh, any of the milk. So for the milk component, we use uh, lactose sugar. Okay. So it gives it that milkiness of it, and then we use a um, combination of artificial flavorings to create the peanut butter and the chocolate. The smell is chocolatey. Yeah, very chocolatey, uh, very peanut butter. It tastes like a, at least a peanut butter cup. Uh, Different, eh? It's like a Reese. Yeah, like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Delicious. So that one is nice uh, around a campfire, usually around the fall, towards the end of the summer, when uh, it gets a little bit colder at nights, but you still like to have a nice uh, hearty beer. That's a very good one for this situation. Really nice. From the smell and the aftertaste is also uh, like uh, peanutty. That, that nutty flavor is still there on yeah. my tongue. And after trying all the beers until now, my tongue is also getting confused. Yeah, it's really bouncing around a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another thing about this, when it comes to using the artificial flavors, it allows us to create a peanut buttered flavor without actually having peanuts in it, so there is no peanut allergies this is associated. peanut butter beer without peanuts. It's peanut free peanut butter beer. Wow. So anyone with a peanut butter allergy or peanut allergy is still able to enjoy it without having to worry about being sick from it. And what do we got here next? Is the, um, so that's the milkshake IPA. Um, a similar situation to this one where we had brewed this as a seasonal beer, but it was so well received that we kept it along. So this is going to have flavors of uh, mango, coconut, and uh, vanilla. So in this you put coconut? Yeah, flavors of coconut, mango, and vanilla. And it's going to be something similar to this, but not as bad, because the hops are dialed back and the fruit's dialed up. So you'll be able to get a little bit of the hops flavor, but the hops complement the fruit that are in there. Uh, for me, it's still tasting a bit of coconut nutty. Yeah, coconut flavor is there, right? Mm -hmm. I can feel that coconut. Yeah. You said 
coconut, mango, and vanilla. Yeah. Yeah, but the coconut flavor is dominant in this. Yeah, and um, another fun thing about this beer, uh, we find a lot of people say they don't like IPAs or hoppy beers or strong beers, but they like this one because of the fruit. So this beer is about six percent, and it does get hops, and it's considered to be a strong hoppy beer, but it drinks a little bit lighter, say, than the hazy. Hazy was the dead bitter. Yeah, so that's got the more hops to it. I think uh, when. If I come and try the hazy one, I cannot have this much more than this. Right. Yeah. So it's more of a sample beer than it is yeah. a drink multiple kind of beer. Yeah. This one. Yeah. Is this last juiced. one is a uh, get juiced, which is uh, our most recent seasonal. Looks like orange juice. Yeah, it's gonna taste like it too. Um, so this is a collaboration beer we did with another brewery over at Jackass Brewery in Cambridge. Um, they were in town one day. They stopped in. We had a conversation with them, they liked what we were doing, we liked what they were doing, they said maybe one day we should collaborate. And then that day finally came around. What's the so this inside this So this is a sour, um, it's a very approachable sour. We find some sours can be um, very tart, very um, scary to those people that aren't very sour um, drinkers. So this one we also add a lot of fruit to it. So it's gonna have mango, guava, banana, pineapple. It's gonna have one of those, it's gonna be like a tropical juice box. So you cannot know. pick one, except the sourness of the yeah. sour juice. Yep. But it comes the together the as a nice tropical blend. It has banana and everything. You cannot pick that. It's just a tropical blend. It's tropical because you can tell it's very fruity, but you wouldn't say it's a banana beer. You wouldn't say it's a mango beer. It's a combination of yeah. all those. You cannot fruits. pick one fruit. Right. So it's a nice mix nice. of uh, lots nice. of fruit. Um, so use, how is the response on this one? Very well. Uh, we use actual fruit puree in this one, so um, very fruity, very. Uh, original fruits, not uh, extracts, they're actual fruit puree. And uh, it's been very well received. We were kind of afraid that, like I said before, with this one and that, they were just seasonal beers that we were just kind of uh, doing a one-off. And that people liked them so much that we decided them to stay. Um, we're kind of in the impression that once this one's gone, because we still have it in stock, that people are going to keep asking for it because um, it's going up really well. Maybe you can pull out your company. Maybe one day we'll do another collaboration. With that new flavor. Yeah. So you, are you planning to introduce any new flavor or this will go for a little bit time and then you will think? Um, so coming up we're going to have some more of our uh, more fall traditional seasonals coming up. So an Oktoberfest is a big um, beer season. So we do uh, an Oktoberfest style beer. Um, we're going to do uh, maybe a pumpkin beer for kind of that fall, kind of October, uh, Thanksgiving style. And then we do kind of some more traditional German lagers uh, throughout uh, the fall season as well. So we kind of try and keep it seasonal, but we also try and keep um, the whole spectrum of beer flavor from you know the light crispy beer to something hoppy and hazy to something that's fruited. So we try and have a beer for everybody, but not to say that some of these people aren't going to like the other beers by experimenting with our the beer spectrum we have. My personal favorite is milkshake. Milkshake IPA. And whatever is coming on the future, maybe I will be not be here to try that. I'll send them to you. I'll mail them at West. Okay. Thank you, Chef. Thanks awesome. for having this. Now we will enjoy this beer and we will resume this video. We are done with all the video and everything. Uh, after I finished the shoot, we went to eat something. Uh, it was a great experience. I went to breweries before but we never saw uh, in so much detailing and so much depth. So it was a very 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 nice experience for me and for those who are watching this video as well. Uh, let me know in the comment section how you liked the video. Uh, do let me know which is your favorite flavor of uh, Imperial Brewery. Uh, and also follow the guy who helped me for the shooting of the video his name is Anthony he is responsible for all the drone shots outside and inside the imperial city so follow him as well his instagram link is given in the description follow me as well uh, and let me know how you like the video till then take care thank you so much live and let live peace rab rakha